so welcome. I am Natalie Forstbauer, the founder of Heart and Soil and editor in chief of Heart and Soil magazine. And it is our delight and honor to bring you Eric and Joy McEwen today. What I love about um, Eric and Joy is how they really connect and intuit into their beekeeping. They uh, will talk probably about that, about using our intuition and how dialed in they are to their bees and how connected they feel to their bees. And that just really kind of struck a chord when we had an inter interview with them on Friday, which um, we'll be launching with issue 16 of Heart and Soul magazine. And um, uh, this is our first live conversation for celebrating 100 years of biodynamics. Biodynamics is rooted in nature and indigenous wisdom. Rudolf Steiner gave his first agriculture lectures in 1924. And we thought this was just a beautiful opportunity to really dive into how biodynamics is being used worldwide by people who are both certified in Demeter and certified biodynamic farmers to people who are incorporating biodynamics into their practices like Eric and Joy are. So, <clears throat> pardon me, Eric and Joy aren't certified biodynamic farmers or bi certified biodynamic beekeepers. However, biodynamics is a really, um, is, a, is a very uh, present practice in their practices. And it's a driving force in the decisions that they've made and in the path that they've walked uh, through their beekeeping and farming journey. So I thought it was a wonderful opportunity to learn from them and their book, Raising Resilient Bees. It is absolutely brilliant. So if you, we're gonna put a link in the chat to this. Chelsea Green is a fabulous supporter of, um, of authors who are writing about farming and gardening and, um, and plants. And they are the publishers of Raising Resilient Bees. And what I love about this book is that oftentimes when we read something about, um, you know, beekeeping or even soil health, there's just a lot of words. And so you kind of have to put these pictures into your mind and figuring it, figure it out on your own. And what they've done really well in this book is they have a lot of diagrams and a lot of how to. So it really helps you connect with what they're speaking about and how you can actually bring that into your practices if you wanted to experiment and try some things yourself. So I highly recommend it to go and check it out and you can get it from Chelsea Green and Leslie will put that in the chat for you. So, um, and Eric is uh, joining us from his farm, Dig and Live In Farm in Apiary. And Joy is going to be coming in. Here, look at that. Wow, that's an entrance. If anything was an entrance, that was an entrance. Eric and Joy have been beekeeping for over two decades and uh, they um, they have a deep foundation and roots in organic and um, market gardening. And they ventured off into their own farm. And I'm just gonna dive right in because I think uh, people are, really excited to hear from you. So welcome to the conversation, celebrating 100 years of biodynamics, Eric and Joy. Thank you so much. Uh, what an honor to be your your first live guest. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, and uh, what an honor to be here to celebrate uh, this wonderful 100 year anniversary. So uh, I feel really excited and I feel really humbled to be here. And um, I was just going to say, and it's a pleasure just getting to know you and your work, Natalie. Likewise. Mm -hmm. It's been Thank fun you. just to get to kind of see all of your pages and your YouTube and like all the good mm -hmm. work you're doing. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Yes. Thank you. It's an honor. Mm -hmm. I wanted to preface uh, our introduction with just a little uh, background. And and uh, like Natalie said, you know, we are not a certified, a Demeter certified or operation, though. I would say that's been a life goal of ours. And we encountered Rudolf Steiner's lectures on bees very early in our uh, education about bees. And, and yet uh, we were mentored in a more conventional fashion by people who taught us how to keep bees in traditional Langstroth hives. And, and, um, and that was the direction we came from, though, uh, in our very, you know, by the time we had our first hive, we had already obtained Oregon tilts standards for organics and we're absolutely adamant that was the path for us despite the apparent hardships with varroa management um and i think part of that too is just uh 
just kind of going back to like who we are, right? That's like mm -hmm. a big part of what shapes mm -hmm. your path. And for us, it was um, that we're more also just organic eaters and that we raise our kids um, with them eating food, uh, organic food and shopping at the co-op and with all those values. So drinking well water and playing in the woods. Yeah. Um, and, and so I just wanted to say that, um, yeah, we uh, as and as far as biodynamic farming goes, I really want to humble myself and say that we are we are humble students of, of biodynamics. I don't consider myself uh, an experienced practitioner by any means, um, but we are on the pathway to learning more and surrounded by a great, uh, great community of biodynamic practitioners in Southern Oregon and Oregon in general. And we're getting uh, to know them and learn and look for opportunities to collaborate and and learn and and uh, and honestly, one of the biggest uh, just to talk about certification just a little bit more, you know, we always really felt that that Demeter's beekeeping standards made a lot of sense, and they they were practices, they were rules that that were rooted in in good common sense, and they were really centered in the relationship between the bees and the beekeeper, and that was something that really resonated with us. Whereas organic standards uh, are all also a really good set of practices and standards, some of which, however, uh, created conflicts in our operation in terms of our ability to adhere to those standards and to, to be productive beekeepers. And I could go into that more later if we have questions. But my, my point being that Demeter used to have a rule about organic, that anywhere an organics standard existed mm -hmm. that you then uh, needed to uh, be certified by both. And there was things in the organic certification standards that that were kind of hurdles for us that we didn't know if we wanted to try to overcome. And now um, now the fact that Demeter has uncoupled that and uh, is allowing Demeter certification without organics is something that's much more interesting to us, because the reality is that we already uh, follow a bunch of practices that are much more stringent than just organic standards alone. And our product is already for sale mm -hmm. on the shelf for significantly more than you can buy organic honey for. So we have never really seen an economic incentive to, to participate in the organics program more than we, we do. So that's enough uh, on that subject. But uh, I will say just going back to that family centric is that our kids uh, were homeschooled in uh, Waldorf as well. Mm, thank you for saying that. And, and, you know, I, I, I have goosebumps because um, I really flirted a lot with and sat in the energy of, of who the first biodynamic converse, like, like live biodynamic conversation was going to be with. And, um, and one of the reasons that we're with you today, Eric and Joy is um is partly trusting the intuition and guidance of these conversations. And it's partly to really make um, biodynamics a place of conversation and to help people understand that it's, it, 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 it's an entry. Like there's so many levels of biodynamics and um, there's so many ways that people can practice. And I love the humbleness and the humility that you bring to the curiosity of what it is and what's possible and how um, you are just meeting yourself where you're at and you have these goals that you are working towards. And I think that's really, really powerful for us to all learn from and, and, um, and sit with. So thanks for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So raising resilient bees is um, really at the heart of what you're doing with your apiary and your farm. And um, you are, stewarding and beekeeping over 600 hives and from what I understand um when when you first started uh your it, the survival rate wasn't exactly super high and now you're experiencing higher su survival rates so when you first started the die-off rate was maybe 30 to 40 percent maybe sometimes higher and now it's only you've been 20 around 20 percent for the last couple of years can you tell us a little bit more about that mm -hmm. Sure. Um, that is true. And uh, for, I'd say the vast majority of our years of beekeeping, our losses have exceeded 30%. And and we've had periods where they approached 50%. And yeah. that 
you know, was principally due to the fact that we were engaging in the use of very soft and somewhat ineffective varroa control. And, and that was okay with us to some extent. I mean, we didn't want to be disrespectful to the lives of the bees and be just comfortable with them dying off. But we were also pretty adamant that we, we didn't want to be intervening with substances that we felt like were harmful to the bees or created residues in the hives or, or just um, we didn't want to play too heavy of a hand. And I will say just to back up a little bit, that's been like a big, uh, that's been a guiding principle of ours for many, many years is uh, trying to figure out how to do less for our bees and let them be more in charge of the composition and the essence of the inside of their hive. And so we used to do more in terms of application of essential oils, and we used to make a lot of tincture of um, um, like uh, immune boosting fungal tincture and what have you. And we would apply those to the bees with sugar syrup sprays and what have you. And, and we have, that's been kind of a goal of ours over the years is to become less and less in, involved, uh, less and less intrusive into the interior of the hive. And so, uh, more and more we're doing that. So, but backing up to your point, um, our losses do seem to be stabilizing and it's a little scary to be brave enough to say that because mm -hmm. we're, this is new for us. So, uh, mm -hmm. but it, I, I think we know why, and we don't think there's any really one reason, but we do think it has to do with the way we're taking care of our hives. And this is something we talked about in the interview on Friday, but essentially I think there's four things we point to. And one is improved delivery of oxalic acid, mm -hmm. um, a, a improved performance of, of the hive body. We really think highly of the, the bee hives that we build for our, our colonies. And we think that they contribute to improved survivorship. Uh, and then also we have a practice of, of, um, how we manage our bees in the springtime in the form of removal of capped brood out of the colonies and, and uh, transferring it into uh, walkaway splits that are brought to another location to rear a queen. That process we feel like is, is a big contributor to the stabilization of our varroa numbers in the springtime. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and uh, natural queen rearing and the fact that we've been running an in, we've like closed our doors to any new genetics into the operation for about eight years. And so we think mm -hmm. we've been raising bees essentially from the survivors of the survivors of the survivors now for, for eight years with no muddying of the water, if you will. And we think that that is leading to an increase in resistance traits in the operation. And we're, we've started testing for that. And we can talk about that uh, later, but we've gotten some good results that suggest that that's true. Mm -hmm. And specifically, what are some of the biodynamic practices that you, that, and some of what you just named and others that have really been a guiding light for you? I mean, the, the, go ahead. Well, person. I was just going to kind of wrap that up a little bit to just include that there's just like this really strong correlation of our losses getting less at the same time that our farm and our operation was just doing a lot better job of like not bringing in things from outside. And I feel like so many farmers and can kind of relate to that a little bit of being like, okay, when did it actually start kind of working? And it like, it's somewhere around that time where you're like, okay, buy, you know, when you transition from like buying things buy, from outside of the farm or getting things from outside not even just your farm more like your agricultural community but um i feel like that was that was a part of it and that's also part of biodynamics you know biodynamics is just utilizing your resources f from 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 within yeah in from a, with, right right in a closed <laughs> yeah and i think so what joy is referring to is you know we've uh, always had a passion about being food producers and that passion motivated us in part towards wanting to be commercial beekeepers and and yet as mm -hmm. commercial beekeepers we've always wanted to to uh, incorporate and reconcile the differences between commercial practices and say biodynamic organic management practices and 
And that has been a slow process. That was difficult. And what Joy was referring to is that with our unsustainable loss rates for many, many years, we would turn and procure bees from other people yeah. and bring them into our operation to, to try and bolster. Everyone else, you know, having compassion for us in that sure. moment. But that's what everyone did. That's what people do. Yeah. yeah. And, and we would per, we would procure bees from someone and we would get them from someone we trusted, someone we liked. We would get them in a good way. We would buy packages so we weren't incorporating other people's equipment and what have you. But the reality was that it, it felt like a treadmill. We, we would buy bees and then we would have unsustainable losses and then we'd be right back where we started. And 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 at some point we just decided we didn't want to do it anymore. And we just said, you know, we just got to stop this. And even though we weren't satisfied with the number of colonies we had, I think hovering right around 250 hives, um, that we just decided we, the only way this, this is ever going to stabilize is if we just stop bringing other people's bees in and expecting them to be able to handle the way that we're keeping them. So, um, but specifically back to your question, you know, the two biodynamic practices that were some of like the biggest hurdles for us that exactly. were also really in, inspiring to us mm -hmm. was, was a, a foundationless uninterrupted brood nest. And that that's been something that we've been aspiring towards for a really long time uh, yeah. in, in more ways than one. And we can show you some old pictures of some of our original foundationless hives. And, and, and then now what we do now uh, is all very well depicted in the book, of course, um, and then the other big hurdle for us was uh, parting ways with the grafting um, program and, you know, and parting ways with grafted queens entirely. And that was something that we weren't sure we'd ever be able to pull off as commercial beekeepers when we first kind of started growing. And uh, and so we're happy to say that we haven't been using grafted queens now for, for eight years. And uh, we think that there's a an increase in vitality in, in the bees, in the queens. Um, and, and then, I don't know, I just feel like it just feels good. It, sure. It, like the more we talk about it, like from writing the book and telling people what we do and hearing their responses and then to kind of like go back to the hive too, of being like, yeah, we don't cage a queen. You know, we really respect your reproduction. You know, we really respect your matrial lineage. And like, it's just feeling good. Mm, so powerful. What does raising resilient bees mean to you? Do you want to answer? No, go ahead. Well, uh, I, it means quite a lot to me. It means raising bees in a way that increases their inherent vitality. And I think mm -hmm. that's a really a guiding principle of what we do. We want to make sure that our practices are bolstering our bees are improving their ability to care for themselves improving their own intuitive capacity improving their own um just development of their own mechanisms for survivorship and um so that we think is a really big part of like our of our breeding program and sort of a guiding principle of our breeding program and in that uh we're not really trying to hold the bees hands too much. And we're really trying to leave as much of the internal processes of the bees up to them. And, um, and also not be playing an overly heavy handed hand with regards to things like disease and parasites. Mm -hmm. um, and so we are not out to eradicate disease or parasites. We're out to, you know, help the bees and ensure that they are you know stable but ultimately helping them develop those those practices for themselves and i i think it's really exciting you know there's a lot of breeding programs out in the world that are about the stabilization of recessive traits uh through uh, through breeding you know through um trying to create homozygous individuals for different genes and what have you and for us, we think that that is sort of a rabbit hole we never wanted to go down. And instead, we want to instead we want to kind of stay in the black box of of uh, of nature, if you will, and letting the bees uh, develop evolutionarily without too much of a selection criteria on our part. And so what we believe is occurring in our operation is that there's a simultaneous evolution of more than one resistance mechanism which is sometimes hard to do if you're if you're um, doing uh, breeding to stabilize anyone in particular. 
And so we think that that's probably a slow process that's occurring in our operation. Mm-hmm. And we all assumed it would take 20 years. Uh, but uh, anyway, so uh, resilient bees, raising resilient bees means keeping them in a natural environment. It ke- means keeping them in a natural uh, a hive made of natural materials. And it means um, minimizing your intrusion in into uh, into, into how they get things done. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to add to that again, just kind of going back into that big picture, which is part of biodynamics. It's really involving people, you know, mm-hmm. the, the um, and apiculture. And I think in order to raise resilient bees, we really have to be thinking about raising resilient beekeepers. And part of that is for beekeepers to start like recognizing in order to be resilient, we, we really don't want to be like getting Queens from Hawaii or using GMO for, uh, pollen cyber, all all sorts of odd things that, um, instead in order to have, yeah, raising resilient bees is also to focus on the beekeepers and young beekeepers. Like for us to have a resilient culture, we need to be educating and, and, and getting more younger, uh, beekeepers into the mix. Mm, it's beautiful. Um, do you want to share your screen while you talk more about some of the biodynamic practices that you're you're using? So we sure. can. We're sure. going to go to you have that loaded. Get a better feel. Right. And so just to give you some more perspective, um, share share with us where you live, for example, and how big your your farm is as well as you bring us through this so we can get a better idea of Sure. We live in Southwestern Oregon. We live on a 60 acre piece of property where three sides are the public lands. Fourth side is the river. But then we face due east and we have a very big grand view of Hope Mountain. Hope Mountain herself. Here's a picture of our farm. It's not depicting the farmland very good, which is in the upper left corner of well, the upper left portion of the screen are the fields that we uh, use. But uh, we also have spent most of our career um, farming on another piece of property eight miles from here. So this property here is a little bit of a new project for us. We've been keeping bees on it for about a dozen years, uh, 15 years, but not but not so much uh, farming. And we're actually engaged in some regenerative soil production projects on this land as well. Um, But the neat about this property is that the vast majority of it is native. Uh, And uh, we have uh, big uh, pre-glacial wildflower meadows uh, that are home to a whole bunch of endangered wildflowers and a very high diversity of plants in general, a beautiful wetland uh, that you can see some of in the left portion um, that has several acres of emergent wetland around it and uh, just a beautiful diversity of plants for, for the bees to have access to forage year round. We moved here 20 years ago um, from Corvallis, more like the Willamette Valley. Oops. Go ahead. And um, anyways, we really moved here for clean air and clean water. We're about an hour to the coast and about an hour to the major highway, I-5. And uh we're just blessed with all the just um, wildness and people and place of where we live. Um, I, I I I think what we should rather than are we going to try to run through this another person? No. Okay. Well, that's the only thing is that where's the right mode for like where I can still see my sides? No. Yeah. Okay. Well, I will flip through maybe quicker than here's a quick uh, plug for the book. You can find it in all forms and most places you like to shop for books, though we like to direct people to Chelsea Green's website. Oh, and you can also obtain signed copies from us on our website, though you will pay shipping. Yeah. yeah. Here's our lovely daughter, Fern, eating a piece of comb honey. And for us, this just embodies the passion of what we're talking about and uh, why why we're motivated. You know, our, our main motivations in being commercial beekeepers is wanting to be present in the landscape of food production to being active partners in in the food production landscape working with wonderful partner farm partners um but also uh, about taking you know we feel the call in our mission to help the honeybee and the more we learned about honeybees and the more we uh 
understood the, the their plight. You know, I have a background in genetics and and I felt like the complicated genetic uh, framework of the of the mating uh, of honeybees was calling on somebody to work at at this scale. And and we feel that our program is significantly different than most of the others that are occurring in the world in in attempts of of helping the honeybee help themselves. And we feel like that this is the scale we have to do that at. So, well, and again, just like connecting, just like higher spirit to people to land. It's like right there in the middle of what she's holding. It's yeah. like that honey, that mana. That's so good for your spirit, your soul, your whole body and the earth. Yeah. I mean, we really think that honey is a, is a vitalizing force in people's lives. And so, you know, by, producing honey we're helping raise resilient people and so uh, but then obviously the bees have to be kept in a similar fashion so that if we can raise resilient bees then the bees go on to help raise more resilient people here's um, our middle daughter clary sage helping us cut uh that's foundationless uh comb so and during our interview i remember natalie you talked about the three-sided frame so here's an example of that right there correct yeah we'll have another shot of that but here's a nice example of a three-sided frame with with honeycomb on it and you can see we're cutting it in a commercial kitchen and putting it into but, jars for yeah. junk honey but a lot of times our honey frames are four-sided because we also appreciate them going through the extractor yeah the majority of the honey we produce is extracted on go. a frame like this this is uh, our first, uh, this is kind of the telltale Oregon flow. Uh, this is our Western blackberry and it makes a beautiful, very light honey with a nice white capping on it. So uh, we enjoy producing varietals. We'll produce three or four varietals a year, depending on the seasonality. This is what one of our productive apiaries would look like. Um, we typically keep 24 to 32 colonies in each location, but in a few places like this, we can have uh maybe up to 48 for a few months of the year and we have bees in about 25 locations mm -hmm. we have uh in the past been more active and we are revitalizing the practice of applying 500 and 501 to our apiaries before we place bees there and that feels good to us um and so but uh the majority of the our um our apiaries are on certified organic farms, but also on land that's not certified, but managed organically. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of the heart of the Illinois Valley. Um, a but pretty... you can see all the like beautiful colors of grain in the wood. And I think that these, you know, they're able to. Oh, you you were. It's like, again. Yeah, yeah and you with... make all of your own hives. Correct. Yeah. You do. And that was. A decision we made largely because we wanted features in the hives that uh, weren't present in commercial equipment, but also because we just really are not comfortable with commercial uh, logging and lumber production. Mm -hmm. We live in Oregon, which has at times uh, in the past produced large portions of or even the majority of the lumber used in this country. And um, and we suffer the the damage in our view shed and our watershed from clear cut logging. And as our, as we grew our business and our, our footprint of lumber use grew, we really realized that that was something we had to reconcile. So we're really stoked though, because it wasn't actually that hard to make the transition. Uh, it puts a limitation on your growth rates, but, um, but building our own equipment is one of the best things I th we think we ever started doing for ourselves. So all right. of our equipment's built from cedar or cypress, uh, redwood, and um sourced locally sustainably most a lot of the wood we use is standing dead i think she had a question. yeah go ahead, go ahead Natalie. Natalie. yeah are your hives insulated and how cold no. does it get okay well there's cedar and redwood so this just increases the r value tremendously so if you are able to like look at a like um a box made out of pine pine is open celled and so it doesn't have that r value but the other thing is that it really keeps humidity in so cedar and redwood are closed cell and so it's like that bubble wrap in between yeah so it, this wood actually has our value which is pretty neat and but to answer your question we don't have very extreme winters mm -hmm. only about 15 degrees at minimum usually and the vast majority of our winter would be more like uh you know 30 to 40 degrees as a normal low right and that's and, Fahrenheit. correct 
Yeah. yeah so we're, we're we're typically above freezing in in the winter time, though we will get as much as two to three weeks of snow on the ground. Uh, though normally it's two to three days. But again, we just really think that that closed cell is. I mean, using this wood is is again, it feels good. It's from right here, but the bees do okay with hot and cold. They just don't like that humidity. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like when you pick up a pine hive, it's really waterlogged and heavy, especially at the end of winter. And so, yeah, these, these hives stay tight. The seams stay tight. They, the wood is water repellent and uh, non-absorptive. So they don't absorb all of the respiratory gases of the bees in the wintertime. And so that's a lot of water that doesn't need to be re-evaporated out of the woodenware by the bees in the spring. And we really think yeah. that that improves their, their growth rates in the spring. And uh, we don't find mold problems inside the hives. Um, we, we don't find bees with dysentery. And we just think a lot of that has to do with the optimal conditions inside the hive. The, we make our woodenware um, seven eighths of an inch thick, so 20, 22 millimeters thick, and uh, so a little thicker than standard equipment, and um, and a little more insulative. And then we make our hives with fairly small entrances, uh, and we believe in that uh, philosophy of the closed dome, where the entrances are only at the bottom allowing the bees to really have a lot of control over the airflow inside the hive and a lot of ability to retain nest heat and nest scent up in the uh, up in the upper portions of the cavity. And then hopefully we'll get a chance to talk with you all about it, but we also, our bottom boards are two-way. So throughout the hive, we have a dado cut that would enable us for you to have a a divider board. We got great um, pictures. And the one, just to have those two entrances, one like a half entrance on the front, on the back, is lovely because the bees sometimes they prefer the sunny side, sometimes they prefer the shady side, but we really think that they love having both sides. Yeah, and you can see that in this picture, our hives are configured on pallets. Uh, we call them four-way hive stands, and we very much feel that they are the optimal way for us to keep bees. So uh, the bees are on a wood, on a wood base connected with the earth. We feel like that's an important thing that a lot of beekeepers miss out on with all the concrete blocks being used these days. And even Rudolph Steiner would um, uh, like for contact with the earth. Um, and what you see is that the hives uh, face outward, right? And so you have two hives facing in one direction and two hives facing in another direction. And uh, that creates a lane down the middle. But as Joy was talking about, our hives have an entrance on both the front and the rear of each colony. And so what you see is uh, that the, the bees have a shade porch in the back there where all four hives are shading that common area. And the bees absolutely love that space. It's this beautiful uh, space where in the middle of a hot sunny day, there's full shaded entrance back there and the bees will completely shut down their use of the sun side entrance on a hot day and only come and go through the rear. But meanwhile, the, all the bees just occupy yeah. all that space in the shade and you see all this interaction going on and you never see feuding. I mean, you really just don't, I'm not uh, lying here. Like they, they really enjoy each other's company. And we really think that bees are a lot more social than people give them credit. And I understand that there is concerns about um, spread of parasites and what have you, but uh, the thermal regulation that comes from having these colonies next to each other like that and having them shade each other's sides instead of being say fully exposed on all four sides to the elements we think makes them a lot happier. And more insulated being right next to each other for overwintering. So this is a great picture from one of the farm partners we work with. And this is just an example of the fact that we work with some really exemplary operations, um, including some biodynamic farms. But this is the herb farm entrance. They're like a really awesome, uh, probably international uh, medicinal herb. Yeah. They do tinctures. They're one of the largest uh, herbal tincture, organic herbal tincture producers in the nation, I believe. Yeah, I'll call this, yeah. And this is just another shot of an apiary of ours. This is uh, actually from Pacific Botanicals. We typically find places like this that are a little off the off out of the out of the way from from the uh, um, what nothing oh, <laughs> um, off off away from from cultivation. This is another shot of a farm field that was uh, under Korean natural farming practices that 
uh, was fallowed for a year. And, and of course, the the farm, the conscientious farmers that they were, they mixed a beautiful pollinator mix into all of their cover cropping. And so, you know, their fallowed fields are cover cropped with a myriad of pollen and nectar sources, including this facilia here. And it's just such a pleasure to have bees in this kind of an environment where the farmer is taking the effort to uh, really create abundance. This is another uh, of the medicinal herb farms that we keep bees on, Oshala Farm. And we put this slide in here actually because bees like calendula, but what really is going on here is the native pollinators are just going nuts. Like all the native bees and the butterflies are just mobbing this field right now. And and the honeybees are, are enjoying it as well. But this is just an example of how farmers, when they're using good practices, can be making a big contribution to, to nature. And uh, we really uh, love keeping bees in environments like this. And I will say, back to our initial discussion of certification, this is one of those troubling conflicts we have with organic certification because this is an organic certified farm. In a, in, in a landscape of largely organic certified farms and other beautiful small scale farms, it's a really like a beautiful patchwork uh, landscape of agriculture going on. And yet this farm would not qualify for organic certification uh, with beekeeping because of the two mile radius rule, which would basically mean if there's any kind of uh, uh, intensive non-organic agriculture occurring, then bees couldn't be here and be certified organic. And so that's like a push pull in our in our life because like we mentioned earlier we want to be part of the farm landscape we want to work with impeccable farmers like this and we want to be uh active and and you know so some of our apiaries are indeed in very isolated semi uh wild locations without even hardly any agriculture at all around and then some of our our scape is more like this and and so obviously if we were to ever certify with Demeter or someone, we would probably have to kind of set up our, our yards and seek out using bees in locations where, you know, in one operation versus another, depending on where they were. But then you all can just totally understand like the added value of the bees going on all these medicinal flowers. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, it should be just, you know, a lot of conversations. Makes That's some, how we learn. Yeah. You know. We make some really special medicinal summer honeys in these locations that we're really proud to produce. Yeah. This is another certified organic uh, lavender field, and you can see it was it was mechanically harvested and left about 15% of the flowers behind to finish. At the end of these rows is actually a row of our hives that are pretty hard to see. Not, uh, right back here. Anyway, um, here is organic artichoke being grown for whole plant tincture, and the farmers let them flower. And one of our favorites, we keep bees on about... Uh, probably 15 acres of echinacea cultivation overall. I do think that oh. that one's, this is the one from the book. Um, it, it's yeah. similar, but that's a, think, got a bee on it. I know. Where's the bee? It's a different one? picture. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, this is a picture that we we put in really quickly just to uh, to share with people about our view of, of the role of regenerative, of bees in regenerative agriculture. This is a field that when we started keeping bees on it about 10 years prior had been hayed for two decades without any inputs at all. And it was basically devoid of all topsoil and it was down to a very rocky mineral soil. And this is a picture from about 10 years later where you can see in the foreground, the annual lupins and the brassicas and the poppies all of those flowers were basically not present on the landscape when we started keeping bees here. Obviously, there were, must have been a few individuals because they needed to start with something because we didn't do any seeding. But uh, steadily, the bees, by tending these flower populations, have dramatically increased the abundance of flowers. They've changed the whole soilscape of, of you know the different plant partners that are engaging in nutrient cycling, but also literally the bees act as a big source of nutrients and uh, probiotics across the landscape that just literally jumpstart the development of soil and plant communities. And so uh, we're really happy to have experienced that in a number of locations. We, we get to directly see uh, the benefit of bees on the landscape in, in regenerating plant communities. And that's definitely something we talk about a little bit in the book.
Um, this is a quick cruise through our value added products. So Joy makes a beautiful line. We make a line of candles and then Joy makes these artistic candles with engraved dark beeswax and gemstones. And we that one's the matrimony design. Uh, oh. We also make a kombucha style drink out of honey and green tea called June. And it's super just low carbon footprint drink. Like you go to the store and you gotta keep going. Keep going. No, you. Oh, you well, finish your sentence. I, well, just that you. Yeah, I just think it's a really worthy conversation to talk with folks about. Is that beverage aisle at the store with all of the the sugar and just everything from just so far away. And our John is made with honey and it's made with the herbs that we um, pollinate. We bring them all back. We ferment them and put it in a keg and uh, it's, it's off we go. Mm -hmm. All right, we're gonna fly, we're gonna fly through these. I wanna try and get Yeah, ba basically just help people understand if you know kombucha, basically it's yeah. a kombucha made with um, honey instead of sugar. Yes, almost exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a line of medicines that we make using honey and apple cider vinegar as the menstruum. Uh, some people refer to them as oxymels. That's what we call them. And so that's what they've been called for a long time. Yeah, They're kind of ancient. Yeah, really. this is an old practice. Uh, and we have a lot of customers that really appreciate alcohol free tinctures. Um, and we think that honey and apple cider vinegar make very good, ex uh, very good solvents for uh extracting and preserving medicinal qualities and we use these extracts to make a series of different compounds mm -hmm. and of course this is propolis we hand harvest propolis with stainless tools that was one of the big impetus for us to get away from painted equipment um we didn't want to have any chance of paint contamination of our propolis and mm -hmm. so we tincture we make about 10 gallons of propolis tincture a year and sell it in one ounce fluid bottles it contributes significantly to our income. And this is a nice shot of our woodenware. As we mentioned, we build all of our woodenware and we do indeed sell a little bit of it. Uh, this is kind of a cool picture, I think, because the bottom box that you see that's darker brown, that was one of the first 50 boxes we built and they're all still in use. We're about 13 years into this right now. And um, and they're, the equipment's holding up really nice. And uh, we, we use some salvage lumber at times. And so you can see the top box actually has a knot hole where the, you can see some bees spilling out. And uh, we're quite happy to use equipment like that, leave extra entrances like that. And, um, you know, the bees use them or they close them up with propolis and we let them choose. I like this picture a lot because I love the colors, like all the grains of the wood. And I feel like, you know, uh, so often we want to, you know, paint the boxes to preserve the boxes, but then also to make sure the bees know which one is theirs. But if you look like at a picture like this, it would be so obvious to the bees that there's so much differentiation happening here that they be like, this one is definitely in my hat. Uh, the quote unquote products that we em are employed in is epitherapy and uh, this is our hive hut it's our hive air chamber it has a bed inside we have a picture of it here next slide um, but you can see those are three hives that are situated inside uh the hive hut where the bees uh fly and enter and exit from the outside but the the hives are ventilated so that the passive hive air the vents can be opened and the passive hive air will then infuse into the space where uh where there's a sleeping chamber for someone to lay on top of them and i just to help your visualization is that those are on kind of like a, a drawer shelf that you pull out so then we tend to them from the outside right and here's a picture from the inside and so you can just see the sleeping bed and uh what's not so visible is that those three hives are right underneath the bed. So when you're in the bed, you can hear them, you can feel them, and you can definitely the uh, smell them. The hive air, hive scent infuses from uh, both the head and toe of the bed. So um, it, it's an enjoyable process. Um, this is starting to stray towards some topics relative to biodynamics. And this is a little teaching apiary in our front yard that we use to talk with people about form and function. And so what these three hives have in common is that they all have foundationless brood nests. And so all three hives have comb that the bees have made entirely by themselves. 
uh, in order to house their brood. And as you see, the log hive on the right is a little bit of a special log hive in that it is actually splits in half. So I can gently open that log hive and you can do some level of inspection. You can oftentimes see brood and confirm that the colony's queen, right? You can even do a little bit of harvest from this colony though, as uh, the pile of combs in the bottom of this colony attests to it, to do much in this colony is destructive and, and a, a detriment to the bees. And so it's an example of how a simple form may indeed limit function and so for us as commercial beekeepers that's important we 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 need function in our hives um and i'll explain movable, more about that in a minute the movable frames but and so here in the middle is the worry hive of course and a worry hive uh we were heavily influenced by uh uh Warre's writings and we feel like a lot of the conclusions that worry came to were were spot on and yet uh worry hives still offer some difficulty in management for us in that they are not very much a movable frame hive, that it tends to still be a situation where you're harvesting combs, uh, uh, a box at a time and what have you, and and limiting your ability to uh, inspect or change anything going on inside the hive. So the hive on the far left is of our making and what we refer to as a natural nest hive. And it will indeed have um, a, a foundationless brood nest in the bottom two boxes, but still allows us to super overhead with um, honey frames that we can then say extract. And why do we want a movable frame hive? Here you see, here's a frame of a natural nest colony being, being pulled out. And that is important to us for a number of reasons. Uh, one of the main reasons, of course, is, is uh, ascertaining the health of the brood and um, getting a sense of our varroa. These are varroa mites on the bottom board of a hive. You see the small brown ovals. Most of you are probably familiar with them, but varroa mite is still one of the, uh, you know, is the leading cause of mortality in our operation. And being able to understand the level of infestation in our hives is super important. Uh, as is being able to understand the level of nutrition and being able to ensure that our bees have adequate amounts of honey and pollen in their hives certainly means we want to be able to move frames. And and likewise, in um, ascertaining the level of nutrition in the hive, also rectifying it, we are uh, we move a lot of honey around when when we need to. And um, and we're happy to take honey from strong colonies and put it into colonies, say, that are in their first season to ensure they have adequate stores to winter. Uh, we, of course, do our best to cite them and ensure that they do it on their own, but that's part of being a good beekeeper, uh, and for us anyway. And for us, of course, ascertaining the quality of the queen, being able to see the queen periodically, uh, look at the queen, and definitely look at her brood pattern. And then, of course, uh, being able to uh, find and locate cells uh, it's really important for us as well. So we, we make our divides with cells uh, or we make our divides with eggs, both of which require us to look at the quality of the brood uh, when we're making those divides. So for us, a destructive, uh, non-movable frame hive is just not suitable for the way we keep bees. Mm -hmm. uh, lastly, of course, we want to be able to ascertain disease. And this is a honeybee here you see in the center, that black bee is suffering from uh, several viruses. And to be able to see that, uh, sometimes you, if you just sit by the entrance waiting to see this, you might not. And, you know, this is a, a, a very low level in the colony and being able to actually inspect whole frames of brood and see bees like this does give you uh, insight into the presence of, of disease. And um, yeah, I'm just going to cool, jump Adam. forward. Here's a Here's a shot of our typical configuration. You can see the the entrance. Pretty yeah, right you there. can see the entrance. We're getting to our, our queen rearing practices. Um, this is typical of how we do things that we run about a third to half of our operation into fall looking like this. So that co those colonies probably have about 80 plus pounds of honey in them, which we feel like is about 25 pounds more than they will need even in a very cold winter. And we do that so that we have honey surplus to move around when we when we need to. And as we go through our bees in the spring, we'll come along and tap into colonies like this um, that are probably these top two boxes are probably all capped honey in in the springtime. So it oftentimes is an easy opportunity for us to say, even remove a whole box of capped honey from a colony like this, and they'll, they'll never miss it. That is reflective on the fact that we probably don't harvest as much honey as we could, but 
that's where we'd like to be. So right. a big and, part and just to and just to um dovetail on that is because you yeah. are your your bees are feeding on honey over the winter. You're not feeding them extra typically. That is exactly true. Uh, we've really gotten down to very little uh, or feeding at all. We we have done organic sugar feeding since we got started with our bees. We've always fed organic sugar. Um, but more and more, we're we're finding that good management practices means we don't need to have sugar on hand to feed and that we can really just move honey when we need to. Um, that said, we fed one yard of bees last summer and we fed some bees this spring, um, about a sixth of our operation that were all new colonies coming out of uh, their first winter this year felt a little light and we did do a little sugar feeding. So it's good to be adaptable in bad weather and what have you, but that was kind of a short band-aid interim until we could really get in in some nicer weather and move honey around and that's what we did just a couple weeks later mm -hmm. and you're harvesting in the spring or fall we harvest our honey in the summer okay awesome. typically uh, sometimes we will produce a spring varietal that will allow us to harvest a little in the spring but we'll have we have a lot of inclement weather around here in the spring and um and uh we can have spring like weather that will pop back up and last until mid-june so we have to be very conservative if we're interested in doing any honey harvesting before that time. Right, thank you. Uh, this is a picture of us milling uh, a, a cedar that we obtained that was standing dead. We do a lot of this and we mill the wood um, on site and then it heads for our wood shop. I have a couple pictures of that. And so this is a, a, a picture of our humble wood shop. We do all of our uh, hive construction here and you know, the value of all the tools in here probably totals about $20,000, but it could be done with 5,000. And so that's our message for everybody is that this doesn't have to be rocket science and, and our designs are simple, which you can find in, we put all of our measurements and designs in the book, um, trying to encourage others to, to take this on. We first learned how to build our own hives by hanging out with beekeepers in Costa Rica and seeing how, uh, simple the tools were that they were using just in it's, open air sheds yeah super small and and them just doing it and yeah like building just taking them. the steps and doing it and we're like we could we could maybe do this yeah couldn't we you know instead of making that phone call every time being like can i order some hive equipment instead doing it ourselves and actually getting our kids in the wood shop was pretty fun too Mm. It's about the scale we work at. These are migratory lids we build, and we'll typically build things in like hundred lots like this. And here we are. This is our. This is the one box size that we build that you've been seeing, and we are hot dipping it with a natural linseed beeswax pine rosin mixture that we make, and we hot dip only the external surfaces, leaving the unfinished interior surfaces for the bees. And we really feel that encourages in propolis deposition and and. Uh, in making an interior that's suitable for them that they like yeah. so i mentioned earlier we'd show you a few pictures of our first foundationless hives these are uh the first colonies that we ran in in attempts to pursue biodynamic certification and these are a 16 inch depth uh frame and so a very large cavity and was a Really wonderful experience. These they were very beautiful hives. Oh, you can, uh, uh, you, yeah, you I see, but our whole living room right now is shelves how made we from them. <laughs> Bookshelves, kitchen shelves, kids' wardrobes. That's what you got to get creative when you change box sizes. Um, here's our young daughter Sage holding another comb from a uh, foundationless hive. These these were beautiful hives, but we they had some drawbacks, and there was things about them that we didn't like. And we felt like in doing the reading and the math that we had gotten a few things wrong. And um, it took us several years of using the hives to realize. And then it took us several years of you to get out of them. And so, so mainly it's just it was a big cavity. Is right? a, Yeah, big cavity. The bees uh, grew slowly in them. But also that 16 inch depth frame we feel like was maybe a few inches more than required for an uninterrupted brood nest and would often cause the deposition of a big band of honey across the top. And then when you wanted to super for production of surplus honey for extraction, the bees would often just uh, opt to not even use the super. And instead they would backfill. And we were having a real big problem with colonies getting honey bound by midsummer in this, in this box because they would uh, create a big band of honey across the top there, which you can kind of see some of in Sage's hands, but also it would... Um, 
and then they would not use the super and they would backfill their brood nest with with nectar and uh it would create a really high mortality rates unfortunately um so so here we go here this we are this we is this is our latest this is how we keep bees on a foundationless brood nest now so that you saw a picture of that three-sided frame earlier with the comb honey but this is how we grow them out and so we'll we'll use a frame like that and then it will transition into something like this and it's a beautiful frame of worker brood there that's all foundationless produced by the bees and what we'll do is we'll produce a, a box of frames like this and you'll get them to a state like this where they have completely filled out the entirety of the box with comb and then we will follow a, a ware type practice of nadiring with an empty cavity below allowing the bees to continue to draw out an uninterrupted nest into that lower box where then you start to get frames that look like this and you see that lighter colored band of capped brood is comb that has only been made and this is a colony that was uh, recently nadired right before this picture was taken and you can see that's a band of new comb that's been made since that additional cavity was placed below hand and then ultimately Isn't you'll... that so beautiful look at that and eric this is you just took that photo i did just yeah. take this recently and this is a this is kind of the the mature uh brood comb uh in our latest uh the way we keep these now and so what we like about this is that we feel like we really got the sizing and proportioning right and honestly we don't take credit for that this is uh we only came to these dimensions by reading the writings of the great beekeeping observers so we feel like Warre made some great efforts into understanding the depth of appropriate nature for box sizes. And we learned a lot from his writings, but also Langstroth uh, was a great observer as well. And as, and then, as are, were many others. So, but what we like about this 13 and a half inch depth frame here is that you're, you're only really getting about enough room for a band of pollen across the top, not really a lot of room for honey storage on this comb. And that is so what we like is that they will put, um, honey to the sides and they'll put honey overhead in a super that they can move up into uh, as they need. But then that leaves us a, a, a versatile system that's easy to get honey where we want it and easy to be able to harvest and leave behind uh, adequate amounts for the bees and what have you. And we also really like this Hoffman end bar too. It, it makes it so that the bees have more space and it makes it easier to move around. And just, you know, the spacing of the hive. Yeah, the Hoffman end bar does go a long way to preventing the bees from adhering the combs to the inside of the box. And that's a big part of what, what we're looking for in our equipment. So then, yeah, this is a bottom view of a nadir colony. You see those are those are 13 inch depth uh, foundationless brood combs coming down to the bottom board. And like we showed earlier, we can also use those foundationless frames overhead in supers. So that's a little bit of a tricky practice. You can produce comb honey, but they will adhere these combs to the top bars of the box below. So timing and attentiveness is important if you don't want to. You can also cut combs with a wire like you would with a warrior hive. And I've done that with these frames. They do that pretty well. So another big part of of what's cool with foundationless comb is the production okay. of drew real, real quick i just want to just check in with natalie I'm how are we doing like how are we doing and how are we doing on time where eric this is the slide where we could you know it's about queen rearing and natural queen rearing and i yeah, just I think i think people are really interested in this piece because it's very um connected to um biogenetic practices too so let's do that and then we'll go into some questions and really like what's what are some of your favorite biodynamic practices? Like if if you were if you were to encourage anyone to start with something, what would those core principles be? That would great. be a great place to go from here. This is yeah. Well, we're you know, we have like three slides here I want to okay. show, and yeah. So this is kind of um, this is where we're getting, and this is leads directly into your next question. So. So this is a foundationless comb. What you can see here, those are queen cells that are. Uh, early in their development so these are those are bees rearing new queens in those cups and those are only a couple days old so this picture is just showing natural queen rearing in its kind of highest form the bees make the combs the bees make the cups and then the bees go on to rear the queens on the comb that they created on their own and then those queens along with an interaction with the workers in the hive 
come to a process of deciding who is the queen that will head up that colony. And that's sort of like the essence of natural queen rearing in our opinion and uh and and, and in a nutshell what we do so um what you see here is you if you look closely that you'll see a queen excluder sticking out of the between those two boxes there so that's a 10 frame excluder stuck between uh eight frame boxes and so the excluder sticks out a little on the side we kind of like that because it acts like a little flag and helps us see them sometimes in the dust but essentially what we're doing is we're taking bees resources uh, and bees out of the parent colony and placing it into that box overhead being sure to not take the queen by shaking the bees off the frames and then we leave them over this excluder for a period of hours and then we take this box off to a new location allowing the bees inside that top box to then embark on raising their own queen and so we will do that with swarm cells and we will also do that with eggs and we uh and, and so that that is the whole basis of how we reproduce uh new colonies in our operation and so we're essentially our goal in our operation is to try to allow every colony with fitness to reproduce. So if a colony is not showing overt signs of disease and is robust during sp spring swarm season, then we will typically make a divide from it in this fashion. And that way we are making an attempt to kind of retain as much of the genetics, the diversity of genetics in our, what we call a meta population of bees um, and thereby uh, allow all colonies to contribute to the well-being of of the whole population. And thereby we're we're minimizing our own anthropogenic selection influence, yeah. if you will. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. um, that awesome. that walk away split is taken. Here's a quick shot to show that foundationless comb is a little bit harder to handle, and sometimes you need to, uh, cut combs and re-adhere them back to the frame you want them on. And and we, we put this picture in to show that uh, it's a little bit more of a challenging style of beekeeping and, and novices should be prepared for a, a little bit more interaction in that way. So this is what our walkaway splits look like. And as Joy was mentioning, you can see we've inserted a division board down the middle. And so what you have is two separate four frame cavities. For us, it's really important that we invest the right amount of energy in raising a queen, uh, but not more than that, because raising a new queen is for us about 60 to 70 percent successful. And so uh, you're going to find if in a unit like this, you're going to find the most common thing you're going to find is one has succeeded and one has failed. And all those bees come from the same colony and they're all at least half sisters and we can pull that division board back out and reunite those combs and there's no and it's a very peaceful process and it allows us to minimize any lost resources or bees in that queen rearing process and for us that that's really important uh to make sure that all those bees get to be part of something positive and beneficial and 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 it happens really quickly and so this process takes about 30 days but if you're really prompt you kind of catch these queenless colonies before they descend down the road into being drone layers uh, with laying workers and what have you, uh, or certainly catch it early and then um, rectify it by pulling that division board. If we're lucky and find that both sides have successfully reared a new queen, then one colony would be transferred out into its own cavity. Um, and you just pull up that division board. So here is an uncapped queen cell being reared on a, on a comb. Uh, and you can see um, that 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 queen cell was likely raised from eggs based on the, the age of those larvae there. I'm rather sure this is an emergency queen. And we feel that uh, that that term emergency queen is not really a very accurate term and that emergency queens sort of have a bad stigma because they often uh, occur in suboptimal conditions. But when you attend to the conditions under which a uh, an emergency queen is reared, essentially a grafted queen and emergency queen are synonymous, except that we think an emergency queen reared in hive with natural feed and um, being reared by bees that are all of common relation is much, much superior. So, And that in itself is a really big headline 
And so our, our practices and biodynamics and how we would get started is to just, is to kind of think about what that means about the emergency queen cell and how to replicate a strong queen just in a colony by the bee's own manners. Yeah. That said, we do time our divides for uh, two, two times during swarm season. And we, we capture the vast majority of swarm cells in our colonies and are able to make, um, uh, make an artificial swarm or a divide with those cells uh, as well. And you see, this is like a, a nice example of a very well worked and royal jelly packed emergency queen cell. That's typical. look at that. It's huge. It's typical in our operation. We can often produce cells that look uh, look like swarm cells, and we think that that has a lot to do with the way in which we rear our queens. Because if you can uh, make up a mating nucleus colony or a, a, a new walk away split colony with a maximum amount of bees and resources inside there. Uh, you can capture both the queenless uh, uh, pheromoneless motivations, but also you can tap into the swarm like motivations of bees. And when bees are very congested, when worker bees have a long time getting their uh, forage unloaded into the colony that triggers bees into a swarm like mindset. And we uh, think that by replicating uh, those conditions in our colonies, we get superior queens. This okay, is, let's, uh, yeah, I think we could stop here and we could open it up. This is a picture of one of our mating yards. Uh, we do all of our mating in isolated locations away from other commercial operations and, um, and do so to preserve the genetics uh, of our bees. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you so much. There's so many, there's lots of uh, feedback in the chat of, for deep appreciation and for what you're sharing. I'm curious, what sets biodynamic beekeeping apart from other beekeeping? Well, I, I think that's a very, I mean, there are a myriad of investigations going on by biodynamic beekeepers that are being completely ignored by conventional beekeepers. So um, but I think um, yeah. pl place-based, you know, is certainly typical. Um, and uh, for us, I there's think- so many things. Yeah. I mean, even just like the, I mean, there's just like the spiritual aspect, the economic aspect, the e ecological aspect um, that are, are not part of the traditional design. I think one of the biggest ones for us was uh, reintegrating natural queen rearing uh, into the operation. I think, you know, when we got into beekeeping, uh, Varroa was a, a problem that uh, there, well, there was not a good handle on at all at the time. We've come a long way since then, but uh, the bees were in really bad shape and people were scared and, and we, we couldn't help but, uh, you know, point to Steiner's warnings as as a light, uh, uh, as a, a canary in the coal mine, if, if you will, like suggesting that that we were in trouble and that we probably needed to to reconcile the grafting problem. I think it's really great. There's been some really great research that's come out in the past two or three years about um, the maternal effect of egg laying by queens and um and that's something that gets right at the heart of of the inferiority of grafting and and is probably some good evidence as to the detriment that has occurred because of grafting and so that that's always sort of been a speculation until recently but i think now with the documentation of maternal effect aka queens laying different and uh better eggs when destined to being a queen, that's new information in beekeeping that uh, is going to force the grafting community to understand that they really might be directly contributing to the demise of honeybees worldwide. So um, I think that's maybe one of the most important. And then I really do think the foundationless brood nest mm -hmm. is a really important 
yeah, you know, understanding the way in which hive architecture is used for communication, uh, the way cell size varies in a natural colony, and how that's completely thwarted by foundation, how the placement of drone brood is relegated to um to unfortunate locations in a conventional hive because of foundation is really unfortunate and so by reinstituting a foundationless brood nest in a colony you're really giving the bees back control over the architecture and the the, the relative comb size and mm -hmm. the abundance of drones we have way more drones in our foundationless colonies and we like that mm -hmm. i was going to just kind of share just thinking about your question a little bit uh and how to answer that. And what came to me was thinking about, so when our middle child went to uh, a Waldorf school and she was still a little shy because uh, we've been living out in the country for so long. And she uh, she said that Waldorf, like we're here to like nurture the whole tree, you know, and to nurture all the different parts of Clary Saint, you know? And um, that's sort of the, that mentality that I go back to. It's just like, how do we nurture the whole apiary? And that like includes the people and it really includes the community as well, you know? Mm -hmm. There's a lot to it. Yeah, yeah, I love how you summarize that. And how how do you incorporate using the biodynamic calendar or do you? We used to. Yeah, um, we, we have, uh, we've tried. Well, we'll send you one. Yeah, well, no, okay. no, I, I just got, I just got, a new one. One. I just got a new one. I got Maria Tunes. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Um, and there's been a couple questions about the mite treatment and people are wondering um, how often do you use it and what you're using? If you could just revisit that. Yeah, we're, uh, so our, our history with mite treatments is uh, originally we started out treatment free. And that was a big part of our losses. We also did a lot of experimenting. We did a couple of years of using only powdered sugar and we would use organic powdered sugar, of course. And, <laughs> and, and we came to the conclusion that science has corroborated that powdered sugar is uh, barely has an effect on controlling varroa mites. Um, it certainly would have to be used at intervals far exceeding what we were able to do. Um, and then we went on from there to trying uh, most of the commercially available organic treatments, uh, which we pretty much stopped using immediately. We tried all of them and found all of them, in our opinion, to be too hard on the bees. And we would have even calamities where we would lose a third of our queens or something to a formic acid treatment or something. And that would create all these kinds of downstream problems for us with our management. We decided we were just done with that kind of problem. And so then we went with a few years of making our own and we would make flash treatments from oxalic or formic acid. And those uh, had limited um, effectiveness and they didn't do nothing, but uh, they were not really doing much to turn our loss rates around, to be honest. So um, then we ultimately, we just sort of, that's just sort of where we ended up. We were just like, well, that's where we're going to be then is, uh, high loss rates with sort of ineffective mite treatments. And that's when we decided we were just going to go back to oxalic acid then. Like we were like, well, if, if, if we're going to have ineffective mite treatments and high loss rates, then we're going to at least use something that's gentle and non-toxic and doesn't accumulate or end up in the honey. And so we've been, I don't know, over 10 years of, of solely oxalic acid and we've done various means of applying it. Yeah. Randy Oliver and scientific beekeeping. Randy Oliver of scientificbeekeeping.com has been a great uh, source of information for us and has influenced us and our treatments quite a bit. Um, and so uh, like I said, yeah, we're about 10 years oxalic only. We used to do a winter dribble and we still think we may again, but we are maybe three or four years into not doing a winter dribble. And I think part of the reason why is because, um, again, we're fearful of oxalic shortening the lifespan of our winter bees, right? As they're coming into spring, uh, trying to rear brood to replace the population and doing a winter broodless dribble 
uh, felt to us as possibly threatening the lives of the bees that you're leaving that job to. So we now really only do uh, one or two treatments a year, and those are principally in the summer. And we have been using slow release glycerin formulas for the most part. Um, and we're, yeah, we're not a fan of vaporization. I think the science shows that vaporization really has to be done at a pretty darn high interval to be effective. And we're not interested in wearing respirators in bee suits. It's just too much to ask of people. So mm. I'm curious, what have been the most difficult parts of biodynamics to incorporate into your beekeeping? I think it's like such a limitation on just and just the the commodity, the international commodity price of honey, like going back mm -hmm. to all that. But it it is it's a limitation when you have like organic honey at Costco for I don't even know how cheap, but it is cheap. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, that was approaching the question a little bit uh, different than I was about to, but I think it's super appropriate. Like, yeah, you ha there has to be an economic. Uh, there has to be like uh something incentive. to hold this and yeah. i don't want to just say incentive but like there has to be like a foundation of of a marketplace to support us and um we haven't really felt that like our honey is already pretty much the most expensive honey on the shelf how and, much is it a pound for me to buy it uh, um well we sell pound and a half for about 17 dollars 18 18 Mm -hmm. So that's about but at thirteen dollars a pound. But at the grocery store, 12. it's next to like a fourteen dollar. You yeah. know, and we're trying to get into another um store, and they're like, "Yours is more expensive by like five dollars." And I'm like, "I know, but did you see the label? We're like raw and heated, blah blah blah." And they're like, "Yeah, but people are broke." So right. For the price point, what else? What else would you say is another um hurdle? Yeah. Well, one of the hurdles uh, about biodynamics, which personally we 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 like, is the uh, honey packing rules about about the honey being transferred directly into the jar of from of which it is consumed from. Um, and we've always practiced that. So we we only bottle our honey one time a year, and then it's stored in the cold in the dark, and and that means that our honey is only available in a crystallized form for about six or seven months of the year. And so we really had to work pretty hard to create a market for that, to kind of talk to people about what you're getting uh, in exchange for not having a liquid honey, you're getting purity, you're getting higher enzyme content, you're getting higher vitamin content, you're, you're getting uh, no contact with plastics, no reheating. You know, these are all things we had to really educate our consumers about because it wasn't something that they were necessarily but that's, looking for. That's in their when honey. we were doing direct marketing, you know, right. when we had our own store, we're doing farmers markets. Now it's like that our customers just have to know that by branding, yep. you mm -hmm. know, like we are special and they're like, oh, here's Dig and Living and it's crystallized. But that means it's great. Like there's there, there are people who know that, but right. And so just to finish your question really quick, um, I think the two things that we've already talked about quite a bit, the the uh, graft free rearing of queens and a foundationless brood nest were also big hurdles for us because of the scale that we operate at. Mm -hmm. And what excites you most about the biodynamic principles you've incorporated into your beekeeping? Ooh. I just think they feel good. Yeah. Yeah, it would just they feel right. Like yeah. instead of always going someplace else to find some solution to uh, that a lot of times like involves like GMOs, which is something we're just like we we don't we don't want to participate with. Uh, yeah, for us to kind of go inward and and figure out our own solutions. And it just feels really good to be making decisions with the bees uh well-being as the primary driver of, of the decision making process mm -hmm. and so and we're just going along with our values and our integrity yeah like sometimes when they're like oh yeah you don't want to do corn syrup and we're like no like we definitely don't like <laughs> that would feel awful to us yeah and, <laughs> like, and so yeah the closer we have come to adhering to biodynamic uh principles and and regulations the better we feel about how we're doing a good job of taking care of the bees it just it feels it feels right it, yeah it's just 
where we want to be. It's yeah. Long-term sustainability for us. What's one uh, piece of advice or one thing you really want to uh, beekeepers, um, whether they're new or been practicing it for a long time and, you know, maybe they're struggling, maybe they're not, but if there's this one thing you could share with them, what would that be? Oof. I wish they'd get off the plastics. I personally think honey and plastics have no business uh, being in, in contact with each other. Uh, well, let's just say they're not. Let's say we're talking to our audience. Um, I think, um, well, I just feel like just to go ahead and try and be part of that, um, of, of getting to know your honey and where you live and really getting to have that be a part of your body and your own vitality might have like huge effects for you and your family. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, it's like the, the buzz and watching all the flowers from where you live. It's just a very worthwhile experience mm -hmm. of course to do that in high equipment that feels good to you that like you walk up to and it feels like, you know, nature it doesn't, it's not like a styrofoam hive. Like mm -hmm. it, it feels like, it feels like nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll just add one thing to that. And then uh, sorry to interrupt. Um, I, I'll just say, you know, this is a big subject of the book is we're in the book. We're really speaking to hobby beekeepers. I mean, of mm -hmm. course we're speaking as commercial beekeepers, but we're really speaking to hobby beekeepers. And we're trying in the book to arm hobby beekeepers with the tools that they need to empower themselves to be their own beekeeper, to not have to really be such a consumer of, of, of the various commodities of the beekeeping industry and to really be able to take certain processes like queen rearing into their own hands, something they can easily accessibly do in their own backyard and thereby kind of unhinge from, from the unsustainable portions of, of what beekeeping is. And so I think my message is empower yourself, you know, that you can really, you can do it all and you can need a lot less than you think from others. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And we are at the top of the 90 minutes. And there's just another really good question. Uh, Fiona, he did, they did mention using um, preps 500 and 501. Uh, so you, that is in, that'll be in the recording. Uh, she also asked, though, have you used any biodynamic preps? So have you used any beyond what you mentioned already? Not, not so much in our beekeeping practices. <laughs> like we've used, you know, the compost amendments in our composting, but as far as bee yards go, um, 500 and 501 is really as far as we've taken to that anything. Like spraying that yeah, our stuff. sprinkling and spraying. Yep. Okay. Um, Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, Eric and Joy. There's been so many nuggets and um, so much heart. And like I, I said at the beginning, one of the things that I really appreciate deeply about you is how you intuit into your beekeeping. And I think that's really a big part of the biodynamic journey is, is being part of that farm organism and ecosystem and you exemplify that and I deeply appreciate it and I appreciate how uh, generous you are in sharing what you've learned what you're learning what some of your um, more challenging parts were and where some of your successes have been and it's it's exciting to be just a small part of your journey and to amplify what you're doing so thank you for joining us today thank you for all your wisdom and you know what with your permission we will send you one of these calendars because it's on the celestial planting calendar it's one we're publishing now yeah, uh, no you've Please. used it yet but we will uh we'll send that along with you as well so you can play with that and it has it actually um um, identifies ideal times to apply the BD500 and BD501. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. You can find a link to Raising Resilient Bees published by Chelsea Green in the description below. And you can find Joy and Eric online at digginlivin.com. That's D I G G I N L I V I N.com. And on Facebook and Instagram at Dig and Livin'. And a few more other places on Instagram. You'll find their Airbnb at air underscore B underscore N underscore B for that delicious experience in their hive hut. And you'll find Joy's work at honeybee underscore healing underscore ours. That's for apiary. 
and you can follow the farm at diggin underscore livin underscore farm underscore and underscore apiaries on Instagram and also on YouTube at diggin livin.